Okay, welcome everybody um, to this seminar of the Center for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance in Canberra. Um, we have an exciting seminar today. It's the first time we're trying out a new format, which we call In Conversation. And um, we'll have John Gastel in conversation with our very own Nardine. And um, we are all in different time zones. Most of you will be in Canberra where it is 11 a.m. Um, John is in Pennsylvania where it is 8 p.m. and I'm in Brazil, 9 p.m. So we're in different places, but the institution we're doing this for and with is the University of Canberra. So I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of Canberra, the Nanawal people. I wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of the city and this region. And since we're all in different places, we can all take a moment and think about the people who were here before us and what they have contributed to the land and to the um, progress of the culture on this land. So today we have the fourth and final seminar in a series on media, digital communication and deliberative democracy. And we are um, so excited to end this, um, these, uh, this series with a bang with um, a very special guest, John Gastel. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna briefly introduce John um, and, and then hand over to Nardine who will lead the conversation with John about a half an hour and then we'll open up for a question and answer. So we're um, also looking forward of course to hearing from all of you. So John is distinguished professor in the Department of Communication Arts and Sciences and Political Science at the Pennsylvania State University where he's also senior scholar at the McCourtney Institute for Democracy. He's done extensive research on the Oregon Citizens Initiative Review, the Australian Citizens Parliament and American juries. And this research has been supported by the National Science Foundation. John has published extensively in the field of deliberative democracy, countless articles out there, many books out there. The most recent ones are Hope for Democracy together with Catherine Knobloch and um, Legislature by Lot with Eric Allen Wright. Um, what some of us might not know yet is that John is also writing novels, science fiction novels, novels including um, Dungeon Party and Grey Matters, which I think is very exciting and uh, a very cool thing to do. So with this uh, introduction, I'll hand over to Nardine and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thanks for being here, John. Thanks a lot, Hans. It's definitely a very good finale for the for this thematic block because Kate Blomet has talked to us about the public, the digital public sphere, and then Tarek Shoker tapped into one of the things that we fear the most, which is issue of polarization and whether that happens essentially online or not. And then we've heard from Ricardo Mendoza and his team at Margem about the different ways in which they tap into different aspects of digital culture and what it has to do with um, democratic emancipation, which was very insightful. And um, this is a very good finale because it's the hottest topic, arguably, in deliberative democracy, which is democratic innovations and particularly focus on online, the online experiences, which has been for the past 20 years contested. Is it good for scale, for cost, for deliberative quality? Is it good for other things? Does it bring more harms than we expect? Um, there's so many unresolved questions until now. Some questions are still lingering from 20 years ago. So my first question for John, considering that earlier works have focused on assessing the deliberative quality of online communication, we've seen a few shifts, um, particularly most notable with your, with your recent theoretical model, which is a very massive shift from what it was before, to focus less on citizens and the deliberative quality of these interactions and see the consequentiality of these, to, it, to what extent are um, political actors and institutions picking up on what's happening in these spaces. So would you give us a recap or a trajectory as you have done in your paper with Todd Davis on um, digital democracy, where online deliberation has been and where it's going and where uh, you envision it to be under the proposal of democracy machine? Sure. I, I Thank you so much, Nardine, for this and the questions to follow. Uh, let me just start by acknowledging uh, grateful for the invitation. Thank you, Hans, and the whole team for uh, having me come here today. I see both people I know and friendly faces. Just letting that sink in. Um, no, seriously, it's nice to see, uh, you know, John Dreisach and so many more, Robert Richards and others. Uh, a pleasure to see you all here. Thanks for coming together to talk about these issues. Um, 
So, uh, you know, I won't try to recap the whole article, but it, it's, it's safe to say that there was tremendous optimism about uh, what digital technology could do for us uh, in terms of transforming democracy and politics, creating incredible opportunities and so on. Um, and uh, my co-author on the, on the piece you cited um, is always reminding people how brief the history of the internet is. Um, and that uh, this age of Facebook and, and corporate uh, kind of control of what we thought would be a public commons kind of just happened yesterday. And we haven't really taken the time to look at what's going on, what are our choices, how could we be doing things differently. So if there was kind of a techno utopianism initially, I think he's right that we've kind of settled very quickly in like 20 years into a techno fatalism um, that, you know, everything is terrible and it's always going to be awful. Um, I think the everything is terrible part of that sentence isn't too far off, uh, but it's not inevitable. Unlike Thanos, uh, it, it, it doesn't have to happen. Um, we can really think differently. And that's where my own thinking has changed is I used to talk about online deliberation as kind of interfering with the, the ideal face-to-face -face conditions for deliberation. Um, now I'm inclined to think that, you know, they're both lovely and wonderful potentially, uh, but we really need to do some creative design uh, innovation in the digital space. Um, if you think about all the things people have crafted for face-to-face -face deliberation, uh, you can think about the, the ways we facilitate, the way we have theme teams to organize ideas during a large space, that, you know, the, the, the graphic recording, there's so many, quote, technologies, unquote, and for the, anyone who has been involved in a serious face-to-face uh, -face deliberation, like a citizen's jury or something, they almost always work. <laughs> I mean, we know how to do it. It works reasonably well. It's expensive, sure, and there's all sorts of, but it works quite well. Um, the online spaces that uh, have been uh, carefully constructed for deliberation have also worked reasonably well. Uh, but the problem with talking about online spaces is we're usually talking about uh, things like comments under a news article or a Facebook chat group or something. We're talking about these discursive spaces that are just a mess. Um, and so uh, the way I come into this digital space is I say, okay, we need to build the kinds of spaces that can generate the kind of deliberation we expect in the highest quality face-to-face -face settings. And if we can pull that off, there is the potential to have you know, the scalability and potential impact that we never really seen from face-to-face -face deliberation um, because of all the costs and constraints on it. So um, as for focusing on you know, a limited range of outcomes and focusing on legitimacy and so on, I, there was an earlier article here, I'll just throw it in the chat, um, that uh, Stephanie Burkhalter and Todd Kelshaw and I did, which talks about uh, how democracy, uh, deliberative democracy, can be kind of self-reinforcing in all kinds of senses. What, what I focus on in the digital space is how could an ideal deliberative, and I don't mean ideal in the strong Habermasian sense, I just mean really good, uh, deliberative process, how could it reinforce both citizens' sense of political self-confidence and policymakers' uh, uh, legitimacy. If it can do those two things, I think the policymakers will recognize, hey, this is really useful for us. And the citizens will say, hey, I'm kind of good at this. And that will be enough probably for, for self-reinforcement. Um, there may be other effects as well, but that's why I kind of focus on legitimacy. That's really, that's really great. Thanks, John. And um, actually, when focusing on legitimacy, one of the things that, at least the way I see many public set up, and particularly online, is that oftentimes the way they come about are done in an exclusive way, expert focused, and they integrate citizens very little in the process of creating these, maintaining them, and even in the application. Um, you proposed a theoretical model where you, we can actually assess to what extent these digital platforms can contribute to democratic legitimacy. But you acknowledge that there are some caveats, particularly that the model doesn't assess the extent to which these platforms are inclusive, equal, or procedurally transparent. But these are qualities that are quite detrimental to the um, authentic democratic quality of these spaces. So how do you think we could think about these how do you think your model could develop to, to overcome these caveats in the future? Right, I, I think of it as a design challenge. So let's just take inclusion, which I, in some ways 
I mean, transparency, equality, they're all important, but inclusion is sort of, if you blow that one, you're in deep trouble right out of this, right out of the gate. So um, uh, in a couple of the writings uh, on this subject, I, I talk a lot about motivation um, and incentives. So what is really motivating people? And if you think about inclusion, what's motivating people to participate or frankly, to not participate uh, in a deliberative space? Um, and uh, once you start you know, thinking systematically about motivation, you can then start thinking, okay, all right, well, if that's what people want, if that's what they're looking for, how could we create incentives uh, for them to participate? Um, or, you know, I, I, you can even get more creative about that and think, okay, what's an incentive for someone who's already in this space to recruit someone into the space? Um, so here, I'll, I'll post just one little piece. Uh, this is with uh, Michael Broghammer. Um, actually, no, that's the wrong one. Uh, but you're welcome to read that piece too. Um, but uh, this is the one I was thinking of, other way around. Um, I, sorry, Michael, your second author in this one. Um, the uh, think think about it as um, this way. Uh, in some ways, we use we use we talk about the language of games and smart games and gamification, which drives some people crazy. I I love games for so many reasons, and I know democracy isn't a game, but we can learn lots of things from games about how to get people excited and engaged about things. And one of the things we've learned about online games is. Um, you can actually motivate people in the game to recruit people into the game with them. And now imagine that um, you were playing, you know, I, I, playing a game is a little bit of a metaphor here, but you were drawing people into a public engagement on an issue in your, your state, territory, region, what have you. Um, and there were really strong incentives for you and the other people you play with regularly to bring people in from underrepresented areas. So in the United States, it would be the census block is the smallest geographic unit. Um, and you would be quite well compensated within the game in different ways uh, for bringing people in who became regular participants, not just to try to draw them in, get them to sign up and show up once, but to actually start participating. And in other words, you'd have to kind of draw them in, train them, kind of get them, help them understand what's going on. That wouldn't necessarily address every kind of diversity because geography is not demography. But it would go a long way toward that just to have representation from all the different geographic parts of whatever political unit this is. Um, and so I think sometimes we we underestimate the the opportunities that are out there to be creative in the design to address some of these problems. In this case, for instance, we tend to focus exclusively on how can we motivate the non participant to participate. But in this case, the, the insights from gaming is how can we motivate the participants to bring in new participants um, and then create incentives so that they don't just replicate themselves, but they bring in people who are different in at least one way geographically. That's just an example. So yeah, I think creative design is one of the ways we get around this. The other one on uh, for equality, I think that works well too. Transparency is a little different. I think the transparency just has to be built right into the system. Um, and I love the idea of a democratic system that is that is self evaluative. So the Oregon Citizens Initiative Review, for instance, has a an oversight board built right into the law that created it. The majority of the members of that uh, CIR commission are former randomly selected citizens. Um, and uh, so I think you need something like that, where the people who are actually participating have a powerful voice in how the process works and the transparency would, would naturally come with that, I would think. Yeah, that's really great, John. And I think one of the things that got me um, thinking about what you said now is that gamification could be a solution to inclusiveness, but at the same time, was this something attempted in face-to-face -face mini publics? Because you're saying that they're not two different things we can take. It's definitely a design challenge. Um, and on that note, um, we always speak of um, these deliberative democratic innovations as, a, as deliberative remedies to the shortcomings of representative democracy, as well as the other democratic deficits. But I was wondering if you have any thoughts about some shortcomings in these deliberative remedies. What, what are the areas in our deliberative thinking that weren't remedying themselves in a circular way? Yeah, um, uh, there's there's three things. The one I won't harp on uh, because I've already said it twice and, and to answer just two questions is design, design, design. Um, I think we underestimate how much design work we need to do because we've been spoiled by our success in face-to-face -face spaces. Um, so I think we need to get really creative about the different ways people could deliberate online. Um, 
I think the Every Voice Engaged Foundation is one of my favorite examples of, um, of uh, a tool that was created with deliberation in mind that creates a unique experience where you're deliberating in a uh, sort of chat-based environment, but you're seeing a visualization of the common ground and disagreements you have. Um, uh, it, it was called Common Ground for Action. It was, it was partly funded by the Kettering Foundation, and now the Every Voice Engaged Foundation is championing it. So I think we need more creative, uh, real innovations in design like that, um, because the, otherwise the spaces that we think deliberation is going to happen in aren't really that deliberative. Um, the second place where I think we need to remedy our thinking a little bit is I think we're still struggling with, uh, I know this, this is annoying, but with the conceptualization and measurement of deliberation. Um, anyone who's looked at my work uh, carefully would say, wait, why didn't you take care of that 20 or 30 years ago, you dummy? Um, and the reason was because it's hard. Um, no, seriously. Um, uh, deliberation is such a multi-dimensional concept that um, I, I've tried to argue that it has many, many components. There are many parts to it. And, you know, that at a minimum, there's this analytic rigor part to deliberation and this democratic social part. But then even those parts break down. And, uh, you know, attempts to, quote, measure deliberation usually are, are kind of misguided in that they try to capture the whole thing and then measure it somehow. I, I've, I've made that mistake once or twice and it, it's pretty shaky. Um, the best we can do is look at the components of deliberation, sometimes in tandem with each other. Um, and even then, uh, how we measure that isn't very satisfying. I, I think the Discourse Quality Index was a real noble effort to try to systematize this. I wish that there was some automatic textual coding that was showing real promise in this area. And if there is, and I don't know about it, please uh, just send me articles and links. It will save me a lot of trouble in my next grant application. Um, I continue to, to hold out hope that uh, the best of those systematic coding processes will be inferior to simply counting the number of question marks per line of text, which I hold out hope is going to be the most robust indicator of deliberative quality, just because it would be hilarious. Um, but anyway, so, so conceptualization and measurement, I think, holds us back, and we, we get kind of hung up on that. Um, and then finally, um, testing, testing, testing. Um, that I, you know, if you're going to design and you're going to have some metrics for deliberation and and obviously for other outcomes, which we are more sanguine about how to measure, um, you know, we just got to do more systematic testing. And I realize how tough it is in this field. You know, if you want to, I, I did a piece on experimentation uh, a little while back, um, and it was kind of discouraging uh, how little there was out there that was real systematic testing. Um, you know, anything approaching our, you know, randomized control trial, um, I'll throw that in the chat, um, but hopefully it doesn't cause despair. Um, it's just expensive. I, I, and it's, you know, it, the scale problem is almost insurmountable. Um, you know, you know, how are you going to have, you know, uh, you know, a two by two by two experiment with, I don't know, let's be robust and say 40 deliberative processes in each cell. I mean, there's not hardly that many processes in a given year around the world, I, you know, of the kind we're really talking about. And then what are you systematically varying? You know, I, we tend to compare a citizen's jury with, you know, 12 people or 20 people that meets over, you know, a week versus a citizen's assembly with 200 people that meets over several, you know, it, there's so many variables. But in the online environment, I'm a little more optimistic that we can do some really nice testing because it does lend itself because it tends to scale up a bit more. We can look at the, sort of the micro processes of deliberation. So if you tie those three things together, I think um, we could remedy our, our, our thinking and theorizing about deliberation by being more uh, aggressive in coming up with new design ideas and then having good measures of deliberation to test the quality of that process that's resulting and then testing, testing, testing. I think, I think we will make advances uh, and hopefully catch up with some of the, the real quality uh, deliberative processes that have been developed in face-to-face -face settings, let's be honest, over you know, more than a century, uh, or if you want to think about it, over millennia. Uh, so hopefully the online space will catch up by doing those things. Yeah, um, actually, I do have a few many questions uh, to follow up on this, but I'll keep it um, short and brief for the sake of time. Um, and so to also hear questions from, from the rest of us who are present today. Um, but I wonder if you also think that there is a, something to remedy about the US centricity of these um, experiments and designs. Uh, say a little bit more. I, I have a feeling I know where you're going, but try give me a little more detail. 
Um, I think we do. I mean, like we were doing that in connecting to Parliament, which is really interesting. It's a supplantation of connecting to Congress uh, developed by Neblu and others. Um, and um, also with when Fishkin was developing the artificial facilitator in Stanford, um, in, Finland, in Finland, the teams were also taking the same design and it didn't quite work in the Finnish context. Um, so I was just wondering if, if that um, US centricity is something to remedy or you think it, it constitutes the basis because you've got the resources, we've got the, the know-hows mm. and then the customization or contextualization could be something to develop in the future. Interesting. Uh, so I guess that question threw me off a little bit because I think of the US as lagging way behind on um, deliberative innovation. Um, I see your point, though. Um, I, so one of the processes I love um, is called console, which uh, hasn't reached the US to my knowledge. Maybe somebody's using it somewhere. Um, but that was uh, developed in Spain and is being used in, in various places. Um, and I, that's one of the more promising uh, platforms to really do testing on. The, the stuff with Fishkin and the virtual facilitator, that's that's interesting. I mean, I, I think of that as a, a little technical experiment, but not really an experiment. I, I, I mean, I, I guess let's call it kind of technical tinkering. It's, it's fun to see how useful it can be, but uh, I haven't seen any systematic experimentation on it. I mean, I've used it in my class and it's kind of fun. I love hearing the voice of Alice Sue. If you guys haven't met her, she's great um, and kind of runs the place. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, I, so that's interesting. Um, yeah, I, it, it would be really deeply ironic if most of the experimentation happened in the US given that the most important innovation is mostly happening outside the US um i would like to think that there could be some universality to these platforms basic features so when i think about the console software for instance um i mean the heart of it was ways of getting people to participate in something more akin to kind of a referendum process and the software translates really well across geographic borders but you're right when you get into some of the subtler details like how would you facilitate a discussion and so on there's going to have to be a lot of customization um they're they built their software for customization so it's a smart way to build it from the ground up um but yeah that's that's certainly the case that as the experiments are are going um there's gonna have to be a lot of translation across countries um I'm just thinking of a study right now we're doing with the U.S. and Germany and we're looking at things like biased information processing and so on and even there there we're testing for instance some um, what are the things about many publics that make people trust them and it, it, in some ways these online processes propose massive many publics but then the larger public being interested in what they found and we're finding inconsistent results even between those two countries on what aspect of the many public matters to people mm. um you know we all assume that oh random selection they're you know, they they hear from experts, they hear from, no, 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 those things often don't matter, but in one country they do and in another they don't and we're not. So I think you're right, there's a lot of differences in those things. What I would like to think is that a systematic research program could bring in enough collaborators internationally that you could be running parallel experiments and you just start winding, you start finding these variations. So back to the point about motivations and incentives. I would like to think that those are abstract enough concepts. The piece I did with Programmer about motivations, that's real fundamental kind of anthropological stuff about you know, what has always motivated human beings and so on. But the articulation of that is going to vary quite a bit. So for instance, we there's a, a pretty fundamental motivation to belong, right? Well, what counts as belonging? What, what motivates you? What makes you feel included and lights up that part of your brain and makes you feel like you, you belong to something? That's going to really vary. But the motivation, I think, will be consistent. So hopefully, and in the, the Democracy Machine project, uh, we've got a pretty good international team of collaborators. So hopefully, we'll be finding those ways that um, the differences across national borders and across cultures within those borders um, will still lend themselves to the same basic experimental structures and designs, even as uh, the details wind up being quite different about what what kind of motivation or, or a little bit the weighting of, say, the achievement motivation versus the belonging motivation. Those things will vary across cultural lines, but I do think the broader theoretical model should still hold up. 
Yes, absolutely. And that's also like, especially addressing things such around grievances, incentives and motivations. There was something highlighted by Jeanette Taxcarp and um, uh, Brian Sullivan in, in their 2014 piece where they argued the unfulfilled promise of online deliberation is because we fail to account of these existing um, considerations. It's just as if thinking that logging online is going to separate us from all the, the things that we live through in the social different socialization, different grievances, etc. So that's definitely uh, very relevant. And I, I do agree that some universality in the theoretical model should apply. Um, two final questions, and it's really hard to put an end to this, but also would be good to engage everyone else. Um, what are some of the current challenges in our communicative conditions and structures that you think will still hinder the potential of online deliberation, even though we design for optimal conditions to uh, remedy these or address these um, uh, limitations? I'll give a shockingly short answer um, just to get us to the next part, uh, but two very different answers. One is um, to the extent that corporations are controlling the spaces in which we do these innovations. I, I, you know, I very much want to build space outside of that, but uh, you have to be careful about building a space where nobody goes. <laughs> um, so um, in Facebook, there's so much already built in there, for instance, uh, to, to channel people into bad behavior because it keeps them there, it gets them excited, um, you know, angry and uh, such is a way to keep people engaged. So I, I worry about that. And even if we can siphon them off, I, I've been making the argument for a few years that if Facebook wants to exist, to continue to exist, it does risk being regulated out of existence as we know it. Um, if it wants to exist, it needs to make some concessions to these kinds of public spaces and sort of help them flourish without controlling them or siphoning data off of them. But even if let's say it does that, um, people are still habituated in really bad ways by, by how Facebook is, is incentivizing them, right? And drawing on those motivations. So that's a problem. Uh, the second one is, um, you know, we talk sometimes in the US about how, oh my God, we've become so partisan and we all hate each other now. Uh, you know, <laughs> that seems to be a, a problem that many countries are experiencing uh, along with a, a, a not unrelated rise of right-wing uh, authoritarian populism. Um, and uh, we have that in a very strong way here in the United States. And so I want to say sort of two things. One, there, there really is something to this affective polarization and the separation of people into kind of warring factions, but there is absolutely an asymmetry to it. That is, there is a level of hostility, uh, both to people and to facts, uh, that is more prominent right now in the United States among uh, political conservatives who are drawn to this uh, sort of populist authoritarianism. Uh, this just isn't true to the same degree among liberals. Sure, there are things that liberals are biased about. And I, in my research, you can see this, um, but it's just not the same. Um, and uh, it's, it's funny because uh, when I started writing about deliberation, some of my colleagues would say, God, you're so reactionary. You do realize that deliberation, uh, synonym for deliberation is slowing things down and stopping the revolution from happening. And I was like, well, not necessarily, but I see your point, right? Um, and in fact, when the, the tax day protest started in the US that ultimately kind of led to Trump, one of the signs people held up was no taxation without deliberation. Um, and uh, so it is ironic that uh, conservatives seem to now be very hostile to deliberation, even though it is in fact a very conservative principle mm -hmm. at its root. Um, though sure it can lead to radical transformation, but it is meant to slow things down um, to cause us to consider. And it has tremendous respect and deference to authority as, I mean, we were talking about a minute ago, you know, that expertise is valued in a way that should appeal to conservatives as well. Anyway. Yeah, I absolutely. promise short answers. One of them was short, but the other was not. Well, both were quite rich, actually. I never thought about um, deliberation as a conservative institution in that sense, but it's interesting to see it in that light and see how it could actually work in slowing things down. Um, on a lighter note, the final question I have for you is um, you do make references to sci-fi pop culture in one of your titles. Um, you wrote a book that's in sci-fi that's pretty big in, in digital culture, not too far from digital communication. Um, so what do you think is the relationship between sci-fi and political theory and how do both a feature in your work or what kind of relationship do both have in your work? You know, it's funny. Um, 
I, I did a, uh, there was a, a, a comedy troupe here in the US. Um, uh, 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 Donegal Young, one of my colleagues, uh, is part of this Philadelphia comedy troupe. And during COVID, they had to go online. And so she had me come on and do this funny little interview <laughs> game and so on. And she said, do you realize how, um, how kind of depressing your fiction is and how optimistic your nonfiction is? She's like, I'm confused. I thought it would be the opposite, right? I thought your nonfiction would be like, we're doomed. And your fiction would be like, there's hope. Um, but I'm actually, I mean, there are, there are things like the Oregon Citizens Initiative Review that most people don't know about, but it actually works quite well. Um, and some folks in Switzerland and Finland have experimented with expanding it uh, and modifying it, and it's worked reasonably well in those other contexts. So that's very encouraging. Um, but in the fiction, I, I guess I, you know, though I, I'd like to think it's funny and fun and engaging. I, you know, as I kept revising it, it took a more and more serious tone. Um, more in kind of the tradition of, of Aldous Huxley or George Orwell, um, kind of a cautionary tale about, um, you know, how, how optimistic we can be about technology and, and where we're headed. Um, but uh, I, I really do think there is a neat relationship between political theory and science fiction in that um, I think deliberative theory is a good example of this. Innovation um, is you know one of the things we really need. Democratic innovation, fortunately, has become quite popular. Some of the ideas we're talking about, like citizens' assemblies and so on, have actually been in fiction several times. There was a, a terrible novel uh, called Ecotopia back in the 70s, which I used to cite from now and then just for giggles. Um, but you know they they talk about mini publics and stuff. I mean, it, it was, you know, so anything you want to imagine, you can imagine. Um, and of course, I worked deliberation into gray matters, but in a very satirical way, because I couldn't help myself. Um, but so I think there is a relationship there that we should be creative, we should be innovative. The difference is that the novelists don't have to run experiments. Um, so uh, hopefully that answers the question. Uh, and I just want to say again, I was thanking Nardine before we started the fun questions. And I was really curious to hear what I would say in response. Um, so uh, I'm not sure I totally agree with all my answers, but I, I'll stand by them at least for the hour. That's, that's really interesting, John. And it's, I, I think like, yeah, practice what we preach, reflexivity, right? <laughs> Thank you. That's a more flattering way of saying, I'm not sure I'm right. <laughs> well, thank you so much that's a really great conversation there's definitely a lot that um i have follow-up questions about and sorry about the noise outside um yeah so thank you thanks a lot for this and thanks hans for the opportunity to be in conversation with john um i think i'll hand it over to you now and um, i'll sit back in the background <laughs>